The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax for Home and Industry present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn, with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. Probably no floor in your home gets as much traffic as your kitchen linoleum. And besides that, things get spilled on it quite often. So there are two reasons why Johnson's self-polishing glow coat gets such a friendly welcome in most homes. Glow coat gives linoleum protection against dirt and wear. In fact, its regular use makes linoleum last six to ten times longer. And the glow coated floor is very easy to keep clean and sparkling because dirt can't penetrate into the surface. Still, things are quickly wiped up with a damp cloth. And you know, I'm sure, that Glow Coat requires no rubbing or buffing. It polishes itself as it dries. If you have any linoleum surfaces that are not protected, give them a beauty treatment with Johnson Self-Polishing Glow Coat. You know why they call that thing you get from the bank every month a statement? Because that's exactly what it is. It isn't a question or a suggestion or a friendly comment. It's a statement, and you'll take it and like it. Unless, of course, you're Fibber McGee of Fibber McGee and Molly. The crooks, the bandits. Twenty million dollars in capital reserve, and they got to put the B on me for for fifteen bucks. The dirty, penny pension orphan, robbing, widow, jipping, nickel snatching. McGee, what's the matter with you? You've been growling like that all evening. It's this dad rat at bank statement. Oh, dear, every month the same thing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. As usual, those cold-blooded, frozen puss pickpockets have lost up my checking account, so I don't know whether I'm broke or merely poor. Don't be ridiculous, dearie. The only reason they keep your account at all is for nuisance value. <laughs> Keeps the bookkeepers amused on rainy afternoons. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll amuse them by, George. I'll withdraw the entire account. Oh, well, that'd be a simple procedure. Just write a small check and boom, you're an next customer. <laughs> what do you mean, a small check? According to their own statement here, I got 114 bucks and 34 cents. Well, 114 dollars is not to be sneezed at, unless you get caught in an overdraft. <clears throat> Aha, but according to my figures, I got exactly 131 dollars. You see, yeah. there's a mistake of $15.66 in their favor. I'll bet one of the cashiers stole it and is having a gay fling in South America. <laughs> I'm not accusing anybody of abscoundreling with it. I merely point out to your attention that the mistake is in the bank's favor. Well, why don't you drop by the bank and take it up with them personally? Oh, no, you don't. No, sir. Every time I do that, they show me where I made the mistake. <laughs> Now, look, this statement says... Put... Oh, heavenly days, there's somebody at the door. Now, you let them in, dearie, while I go take off this apron and put my face on. Uh... Now, don't get into any fights with the bank. Uh... They're pretty nice people outside of business hours. Ah, uh... uh, there goes a good kid. If I had it to do all over again, I'd marry her twice as quick. I'll pay for the license myself. <laughs> my jo... Oh, come in. Are you Mr. McGee? In the flesh, bud, in the pale, quivering flesh. And if you're from the Fourth National Bank, wipe that smile off your puss. You're out of character. But I'm not a banker, Mr. McGee. I am T. Orville Drake of New York. T. what the who? That's T. Orville Drake. You don't remember me, do you? Well, according to etiquette, bud, I suppose I ought to say, of course I do, Orville. And then stall around and try to remember where we met. <laughs> but frankly, you got me. <laughs> uh, well, it's not surprising that you've forgotten, Mr. McGee. Generous impulses like yours are too spontaneous to be long remembered. And after all, it was six years ago. What was six years ago? The incident I referred to. Six years ago on the bus from Albany to Boston, I lost my wallet. 
And out of that whole busload of people, you were kind enough to loan me the money to pay my fare. Remember? Well, I'll be... Uh... Here, here, here. You see this check? Oh. I've been carrying this for six years, knowing that someday business would take me through with Fulvet. Well, Diogenes, blow out that lamp. <laughs> A check for four bucks. My gosh, why didn't you mail it to me, bud? Well, I wasn't sure of the address, old man. Besides, I wanted to hand it to you in person. And thank you again for your kindness. Yes. Well, I'll be running along. No, 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 my gosh, Orville. Come in and sit down. It's a pleasure to meet a guy as honest as you. You just restored my faith in human nature. Well, I'll just stay a moment, McGee. Just a moment, I... Oh, very pleasant home you have here. <laughs> well, we like it. <laughs> <laughs> we have to like it. <laughs> have a cigar, Orville? Oh, thanks, thanks. I have one. You got two? Uh, thanks. <laughs> boy, oh boy, oh boy. A 50 center. <laughs> you must be up in the blue chips, or <laughs> Well, I've always managed to make money, McGee. I guess I'm just naturally acquisitive. Yeah, me too, Orville. Always asking questions. Oh. <laughs> Some people think I'm nosy, but that's... I what... didn't say inquisitive. I said acquisitive. Oh, ack. Yes. <laughs> I thought you said ink. You... <laughs> You here on business, Orville? What do you do, insurance or something? No, no. I'm an engineer, McGee. No kidding. What you, railroad? You... <laughs> I'm a mining engineer. I locate and develop mining properties for an eastern syndicate. But let's not talk shop. No, I would just... McGee, who was... Oh, <laughs> excuse me. I didn't realize you had company. And now don't get up, please. Uh, Orville, I want you to meet my wife, Molly. This is T. Orville Drake, an old pal of mine from New York. How do you do? I'm sure. Mrs. McGee, this is a great pleasure. If I'd known what a beautiful wife my friend had, I'd have been here much sooner. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Drake, now none of your bally scuffle. You I see why you New Yorkers call it Times Square. You don't waste any, do you? <laughs> You know what, Molly? Orville put the clutch on me for four bucks six years ago and come all the way from New York to pay it back. Oh, isn't that nice? Yeah. Won't those other people be pleased when he gets back and tells them it's all settled? Huh? What other people, Mrs. McGee? You mean he didn't demand a note with three co-signers? Well... <laughs> <laughs> oh, ain't this great, though? Nothing like old friends getting together again. Just get in town, Mr. Drake? Yes, I flew in this afternoon. And flew I... in, eh? Hmm. Have any trouble with reservations, Orby? No, no. I travel on a number four priority. Number four priority, eh? Ah, oh, that's a great little airplane. <laughs> Much smoother and faster than the old number three priority. I remember one time Jimmy Doolittle took me up. McGee, one... I think that... Yes, they... sir, there's nothing like air travel. I predict that after the war, there's going to be airlines all over the world. I predict that one of these days, every little town in the country will have a landing strip, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McGee's had a lot of experience, too, Mr. Drake. Really? Flying? No, predicting. Pre <laughs> McGee, don't leave Mr. Drake's hat lying there on the table like that. Hmm? That's as inhospitable as a loud clock. Hang it up. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. McGee. I can only say... Oh, for a she's minute. right, Orville, old kid. She's a great one for a neat-looking house. Can't stand to see things messed up or out of place around the house. So when she says, hang up the man's hat, I know exactly what... No, 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 McGee, not in there. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting company, Orville. <laughs> Billy Mills and the orchestra play Dance with a Dolly.
go to stay for dinner, Mr. Drake? It won't be very fancy, though. I hope you like Irish stew. Oh, I'm very fond of Irish stew. And I certainly hope you people will come and visit me in New York sometime. I'd like to return this hospitality. Oh, <laughs> I'd love to come to New York, Mr. Drake. I want to see the Statue of Liberty and the Hippodrome and the Aquarium and the Flatiron Building. Flatiron Building? My gosh, Molly, you're way out of date. There's a hundred buildings taller than the Flatiron Building. I don't want to see the building. I want to buy a Flatiron. <laughs> you know, it's getting so terribly... Oh, hello, Alice. Come in, dear. Oh, excuse me. I didn't know you had company, Mrs. McGee. Hiya, Pop. <laughs> Hello, Alice. Orville, this is our boarder, Miss Darling. Alice, this is T. Orville Drake, old pal of mine from New York. Hello, Mr. Drake. How do you do, Miss Darling? Any relation to the Westchester Darlings? Oh, creepers, <laughs> it could be, Mr. Drake. Though my cousin Chester didn't go west, he went south. He... <laughs> uh, with $8,000 that belonged to some... Oh. <laughs> um, Mrs. McGee, did Harold Bach call me on the phone? No, he didn't, Alice. You only got calls from Maury Needham and uh, Jeff Lewis and Mel Brorby. Are you expecting a call from Harold Bach, Alice? Yes, a nasty little double-crosser. You know what he did, Pop? What did he do, Alice? Well, he stood me up last night. Mm. Here I sat with my best face on in a new dress that would make a hermit come down from the hills. <laughs> and I waited and waited and waited, and Harold never did show up. I think I was pretty uncalled for. <laughs> We'll come to New York sometime, Miss Darling. I assure you, you'll not be kept waiting. Oh, gee, thanks, Mr. Gander, but... Drake, Alice. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, thanks, Mr. Drake. I hope I can come to New York sometime. I've always wanted to go to the Stork Club and watch them feed the columnists. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, Pop, if Harold calls, will you give him a message for me? Sure, kid. What's the message, Alice? Just give him the Alice Darling curse. May he run out of cigarettes while changing tires in his tuxedo after a blowout on a rainy night ten miles from a filling station. Goodbye, Mr. Drake. <laughs> Charming girl. College student? No, she works in an airplane plant, Orville. Oh. Welder. Mm. Used to do riveting, but she was too light for it. Gave her the hiccups. <laughs> yeah, she's what Alexander Graham Bell had in mind when he invented the telephone, Mr. Drake. Well, it's nice to be young, if you're strong enough to stand it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I get quite a kick out of talking to her boyfriends. A lot of them are servicemen, and I'm a veteran from the last war myself, so... <laughs> No, dearie, you mean uh, veteran. I don't mean any such a thing. A veteran is a guy that don't eat meat. No. No, no, that's a vegetarian, McGee. <laughs> now, don't give me that, Orville. I know what a vegetarian is. That's anybody that's 80 years old. Ah, <laughs> oh, you're thinking of octogenarian, sweetheart. Go on, an octogenarian is a devil fish. No, 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 that's an octopus. Well, then, then what's a veterinarian? That's a man who doctors horses. And mules? Yes. That's what I was in the last war. I was an orderly for <laughs> Well, you see, I guess I know what I'm talking about. Oh, four cows every little... Oh, uh, excuse me. Come on in, Mr. Wilcox. This is Mr. Drake from New York. Orville, this is Harlow Wilcox, the personality kid, with his feet on the ground and his mind on the linoleum. Glad to... <laughs> well, Mr. Wilcox, I'm glad to know you. You know, that name is very familiar. Don't you do something in radio? Oh, he certainly does, Mr. Drake. Mr. Wilcox is one of our leading radio personalities. Oh, you just say that. <laughs> well, I knew I remembered that name. You're on the air for, uh, 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 now don't tell me, don't tell me. <laughs> Let's see. Now let me guess, let me guess. I'll give it a few minutes. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. What is it that you pour a little of on the linoleum, spread it around with a long handled applier, and let it dry to a mirror like polish in 20 minutes or less? Concentrate, Orville. Yes. Concentrate. <laughs> What is it, Mr. Drake, that helps restore the color and brilliance of worn and faded linoleum and protects it from scuffing and scratching? Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. You got it, Orville. Oh, you got it. You want to take the $8 and quit? Or try for 16 and a free package of mothballs? <laughs> no, I knew I'd get it. You know, my children listen to your program every week. It's a little silly for grown-ups, I think, but... <laughs> oh, the youngsters love it. Oh, say, tell me. Tell me, who plays the part of Jerry Colonna? Is that H.P. Colton Bourne? Well, let's drop the subject while we still know who we are. <laughs> do you uh, ever get up around Racine, Wisconsin, Mr. Drake? Well, I don't think I the, ever do. The uh, reason I asked was I'd like to take you through the Johnson Wax factory sometime. See just how they make self-polishing glow coats. Very interesting. 
Oh, say, Feber, have you got a picture of our office building? Have we, Molly? Yes, yes, it's in the table out in the hall, Mr. Wilcox. The top drawer. But be careful how you handle that table, Junior. It's got very loose drawers, if you'll pardon the expression. <laughs> well, I'll mail him a folder. Well, I've got to be getting along, folks. Remember, Mr. Drake, if you're up in Racine, Wisconsin, drop in and mention my name. I certainly will, Mr. Von Zell. Nice try. <laughs> Thank you. So long, Eddie. Good night, Ida. <laughs> That ends a thoroughly confusing few moments. Yeah. Dinner should be ready in just a little while, boys. Somebody at the door, Orville. I mean, at the door, Orville. Well, I'll go see who it is and give you and Molly a chance to say a few nice things about me. <laughs> I'll try to get you. Oh, keep your claps down. I'm coming. <laughs> Hi, mister. Oh, hello, Teeny. Now, now, look, I haven't got time to bat the fat with you just now. M Mrs. McGee and I are having a fella from New York for dinner. You have a... <laughs> oh, not that. You know what I mean. He's our guest for dinner. So you run along now. Hey, like... mister. Yes, yes, yes. What is it? Look, we're friends, aren't we, mister? Yes, yes, yes. We've been through a lot together, me and you. Haven't yeah. we, mister? Yes, yes. You and I are... All right, all right, all right. We're buddies. We're pals. We're Charlie Damon and Susie Pythias. <laughs> now, what are you driving at? Well, I always say that every young girl should have an older man as a friend. Yeah. Somebody she could always go to for sympathy and advice and stuff. So when she has a personal problem... Look, sis, look, never mind the heartthrobs. Get down to cases. Well, you know Willie Toops, mister. Yes, I do. Hmm? I said, yes, I do. You do what? I know Willie Toops. Gee, so do I. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned him, Mr. Onacon. He's my problem. Now, wait a minute, sis. I haven't got time to stand out here on the stoop and act like one. <laughs> Just to listen to a lot of childish words. Uh... <laughs> oh. Now, stop that bawling. Cut it out. I didn't mean to be impatient, but after all, I, I got a guest waiting for me inside. So as I was... I guess you don't like little children, I bet you. Oh, no, I do, too. I love little children. I think they're the cutest people of their age that there is. <laughs> What's biting you? Well, suppose you were a young girl like me, and she had a boyfriend like maybe Willie, too, uh -huh. and he had a slingshot. And the little girl bet the little boy ten cents he couldn't break somebody's garage window with one shot, yeah. and he did. <laughs> and gee, the window cost a dollar and a half to get it fixed. <laughs> and the little girl is in an awful jamming. If you were the young girl's friend, what would you advise her to do, mister? Hmm. I'd advise her to go tell her father the whole story. Take her beating and tap him for a dollar sixty. Now, if you'll excuse me, I just... <laughs> and I thought you'd help me. <laughs> Gee, I thought we were friends. Oh, my gosh. Cut it out, sis. Cut it out. Here. Here's a dollar sixty. Now go square yourself. Whose garage window was it? Yours. Hmm? <laughs> the king's men to sing Bahia.
I sure hated to see old Orville leave, Molly. Yeah. Great guy. Imagine anybody traveling all this distance to pay a guy four bucks that he borrowed six years ago. Yes, and he had such nice manners, mm -hmm. too. Did you notice how he held his napkin in front of his face when he used a toothpick? <laughs> oh, well, class will tell, baby. <laughs> Did you see the ring Mr. Drake was wearing? Mm -hmm. It looked like the Hope Diamond. <laughs> Hope will never have a diamond as big as that. <laughs> and if he does, Crosby will be on the mounting. <laughs> Incidentally, Molly, that was a very good dinner we had tonight. Don't tell me, dearie. Tell Beulah. Well, bye, George. I will. Hey, Beulah. Oh, Beulah. Somebody shopping for the ship? <laughs> yes, Beulah. Mr. McGee wanted to tell you what a nice dinner that was. No kidding, Beulah. That was as fine a flock of food as ever flung a fang into. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you enjoyed it, folks. <laughs> Much rather cook for grown-ups than for children like I do the last place I work. Why, Beulah? Oh, I don't know, ma'am. Big folks enjoy eating more, seems as if. <laughs> Somebody else can tote the tasties for the tiny toss. I'd rather whip up a middle-aged spread. <laughs> ah, well, it was great stuff, Beulah. That Irish stew was so good, I was thinking of doubling your salary, if you don't mind a bad pun. <laughs> if anybody does, I'm out of business. <laughs> Oh, it really was a grand dinner, Beulah. Oh, now, folks, you're going to embarrass me. You know how I am. I'd rather have a little praise now and then than a raisin fair. Beulah, what is you saying? Uh, Beulah, did you say you were going to take Friday off this week? Yes, ma'am. You say ain't going to disaccommodate anybody? Not at all, Beulah. Is this some special occasion? Yes, sir, it is. Mm -hmm. Friday is Navy Day, and I got a brother going to be here on furlough. You got a brother in the Navy, Beulah? Yes, ma'am. Mighty fine boy, too. He got a medal for saving three sailors' lives at Pearl Harbor. Boy, that's wonderful. Well, the whole Navy is one for Mr. McGee. They're really in their pitching. And it sure burns men like my brother up when folks talk about celebrating the end of the war when Germany give up. He says it's like burning the goalpost at the end of the first half. And he says we still got a long time war on our hands licking them Jappies. And anybody that quits fighting or working now is just no account trash. Well, you're really proud of your brother, aren't you, Beulah? Proud of all of them, ma'am. Every time I walk down the street and I see a boy in that little old blue uniform, I say to myself, I say, love that man. <laughs> my, my, isn't she sweet? She certainly is. Say, these are mighty good cigars, old Lord <laughs> Got his initials on the cigar band, too. You see it on the cigar, T-O-D? That's interesting. You mm -hmm. know, they say if your initials spell a word both ways, you'll be rich. No, not necessarily. I got a cousin named Marvin Underwood Degnan. His initials spell mud one way and dumb the other. <laughs> and he makes his living picking cranberries. <laughs> that shows maybe old Orville forgot something. Come in. Oh, Dr. Gamble. Hello, doctor. Hello, Molly. And how are you, little beaver? <laughs> Hi, Doc. You're just the guy I want to see. You got any castor oil with you? Yes, I have. But you better let me have a look at you first. Where do you hurt? I don't hurt. I feel wonderful. Well, then why do you want the castor oil, McGee? Well, oil a couple of casters. My dresser squeaks. <laughs> so does your sense of humor, bird brain. I've had a very tough day, and I'm in no mood for your rustic wit. The shortage of doctors makes a lot of work for the ones that are left, I suppose, huh? Well, it really does, my dear. I'm a tired old man. And if there's any hot coffee in that coffee pot, you've made a valuable friend. Why, certainly, Doctor. Here, let me give you a cup. <clears throat> Drink hearty, Doc. Not that coffee will do much for that permanent sleepy look of yours. Thanks. And this permanent sleepy look of mine is probably due to the fact that I'm permanently sleepy. I get up five times a night to drive around town and tell other people to stay in bed for two weeks. <laughs> See, you had company tonight. Yes, we did, Doctor. How on earth did you know? Extra coffee cup. Elementary deduction. Every doctor's more or less of a detective, you know. Well, tell us more, Ellery, you big phony. <laughs> All right. He had plenty of money, too. Because you're smoking a 50-cent cigar and you never paid more than two and a half cents for one in your life. 
<laughs> I'd offer you one, Doc, but they're a little rich for you. <laughs> Besides, this is the last one. Mm. I'm sorry you weren't here to meet Orville, the first completely honest man I ever met in my life. He really is, Doctor. You know, it seems McGee paid his fare on a bus some six years ago, and he made a special trip to Whistful Vista to pay it back. Ain't that wonderful, Doc? No, it doesn't make sense psychologically. What do you mean, Doctor? It violates all the basic principles of human behavior. It's eccentric and therefore subject to suspicion. There you go, you cynical old septic. A guy can't even do a decent thing in this life, but what you have to tear is reputation apart. Well, my gosh, he wouldn't even sell me three shares of his tungsten mine without telling me it might be no good. Three shares of what? Mining stock. Only paid 35 bucks a share for it, too. Oh, McGee, you didn't tell me. I see. He shows up here with four dollars. He says you loaned him on a bus six years ago and sells you some mining stock. Oh, brother. When I think of the human flesh, I have to carve my way through for 105 bucks. (laughs) Now, look here, doctor. This man is a friend of mine. And I won't have you making any derogatory... McGee? Huh? Where did you say you met Mr. Drake? On the bus between Albany and Boston. And when was that? Way back in... uh, It was when... Oh, my gosh. i never been in Albany. Every now and then, it's a good thing to check up on fundamentals. For example, do you know the real number one reason for putting wax on your floors, furniture, and woodwork? Well, it's for protection. To guard those surfaces against wear and dirt, make them last longer, save on costly refinishing. The rich, mellow beauty that Johnson's Wax gives is really an extra dividend. And so are the many hours of work that you save when your things are wax protected. The next time you apply a coat of Johnson's Wax to your floors or tabletop or leather goods, remember that you are only doing what nature has always done. Did you know that when you rub a red apple and it shines, you have merely buffed up a waxed surface? That's true. And man, throughout the ages, in protecting his things with wax, has merely imitated nature. Today, Genuine Johnson's Wax has a special role to play in helping you to take better care of your things, making them last longer, protecting their beauty. Oh, what a chump I am. What a fool. Oh, (laughs) stop worrying, McGee. Everybody gets taken in by a sharpshooter at some time in their life. That don't worry me. It's that check I gave the guy for this mining stock. Well, heavenly days, silly. Stop payment on it. I can't. Why not? Well, my pen ran dry when I was making it out, and we got to talking, and I never did sign it. How can I ask the bank to stop payment on a check that's no good? What can I say? Good night. Huh? Oh, good night. Good night, all. This is Harlow Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax Finishes for Home and Industry, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. This is the National Broadcasting Company.